pleasant tides, dear viewers. This is Five of Clubs, and today we'll finally dive into our Simpleton solo playthrough of Kingdom Death Monster, a 1-4 player cooperative horror tactical combat campaign game. For those of you who missed it, given the massive scope of this game, I recently released a Kingdom Death Monster Primer video that explains the game from a macro level in preparation for this playthrough. So if you're unfamiliar with the game, watching that video will help you get up to speed. Otherwise, I'll do my best to succinctly review the reasons behind the game's happenings during the playthrough, but I don't want to spend too much time restating what was previously said. That said, I have myself learned most of the game through watching a gameplay session or two, so I'm confident that others can as well. Today we'll be diving into a brand new Scalding Seas campaign, which takes us through the tides and trials of the people of the sea. For the Kingdom Death initiated out there, you might be cocking your head at those names, as they don't seem to reflect the contents of any current expansion. Well, that's because they aren't part of any current expansion. Indeed, The People of the Sea is a custom campaign expansion that's currently in early development and playtesting, and we've been granted permission to play it here on the channel. As such, some of the content we'll be interacting with is currently awaiting art assets and or might be subject to change, but what's already here is pretty remarkable. So, big shout out to PyroGuy, the primary developer for this expansion, and the rest of the CCG content team for getting these assets together and working to refine them. If you'd like to follow along with their progress on this, or any of their other projects like the Storm Knight, the Drifter Knight, Alice in the Twilight Knight, and the Harvester Worm, or any of their other great stuff they have, I'll pop a link to their Patreon page below where you can check it all out. They're a swell set of folks, and at least for me, their content productions have really helped dampen the pains of waiting for the ever-elusive gambler's chest. But enough blabber, let's begin our nautical nightmare. Like every Kingdom Death campaign, The Scalding Seas begins with a prologue story that sets the scene. Once upon a time, in a place of endless ocean, a myriad of bodies lay in shallow water, ink-stained faces just above the waves. The bodies, though alive, lay limp and unmoving. One day, a cluster of thin purple tentacles cut through the steaming water, latching onto several bodies and biting deeply. With a shock, the survivors wake, howling wordless screams into the darkness. The tentacles retreat as the people look from their bloody wrists to each other. They have no words, they each know nothing. With a colossal boom, the sky shouts back. Thunderclaps paint the world in strokes of white and blue. Around them, a horizon of dark, cascading waves and a curious storm on the horizon. The survivors lift their lanterns, feel its draw, and wade into the dark waters. Suddenly, a monster emerges from the darkness, its ravenous cry echoed across the breakers. It attacks. The people are no match. It tears their flesh and crushes their bones between its teeth, shocking others with conjured lightning. Overcome with terror, a sudden instinct compels them to fight. There was no escape. The people did not want to die. Spotting a log, they desperately grab for it, tearing at it with all their might and coming away with hardened sticks of wood. They were jagged and lethal. Armed together, the people roar in defiance. Somewhere, in the place of endless ocean, the nameless stand united. They have nothing but a need to survive and a lantern to light their struggle. As you can see, the introduction to this story spawns relative newborns, entirely disoriented in unfamiliar waves, wrapping bizarre bleeding tentacles about their wrist, and waving them straight into the jagged jaws of the game's first monster. Do you know what that sound is, Highness? Those are the shrieking eels! If you don't believe me, just wait! They always grow louder when they're about to feed on human flesh! <laughs> Quite right. The Shrieking Eels of the Scalding Seas are slippery, sinuous sea serpents that shock and shred survivors like it's second nature. But don't despair just yet. We've got a few advantages that'll give us a fighting chance. Despite our lack of sea legs in this watery battlefield, we are mercifully taking on this creature in shallow water. That means that, at least for this fight, we won't have to worry about swimming just yet. Additionally, we also each gain plus one movement token which increases our innate movement range from 4 spaces to 5. This matches the movement range of the prologue eel, so we'll have an easier time keeping up with our foe than if we were swimming. Additionally, if we get knocked down, we'll start to accrue exhaustion tokens, which can eventually lead to us drowning, so we'll try to avoid that. Additionally, we won't have to worry about weather effects or other terrain interactions, meaning we can focus solely on our foe, and it can focus solely on us. 
Secondly, we have a few implements on hand and waste to defend ourselves with. As the intro story indicated, we were able to pry a splintered shiv from a nearby driftwood log. This wooden shiv will allow our survivors to perform rudimentary attacks against the bellowing beast, which is our only hope of killing it before it kills us. Adorned about our loins, we each have a piece of cloth, providing modesty and defense around our waste locations. Admittedly, one measly point of defense isn't a great buffer against damage, but something is better than nothing. Lastly, we each have a tentacle tip coiled around one wrist. This item has the cursed keyword, meaning that it is bound to our respective loadouts unless removed through specific conditions. In this case, we are able to spend an action to eat the nasty tentacle, which will give us a frenzy buff and allow us to heal one hit location. I found that the most potent medicines often taste terrible, but this is on a whole other level. It could come in handy in a pinch though. And with that, the stage is set for battle. Will our survivors live up to their namesake, or will they perish before the ferocity of their foe? Let's set sail and find out together. Right. Right, right, right. Well, here we go. Let's go ahead and dive on into the battle, and let's see the first AI card. Voracious Bite. Pick target closest threat in range. Okay. So threats, uh, as defined in this game, are survivors that are... Uh, within a certain area that are standing. So knockdown survivors are not considered threats. Um, and there's other conditional things that can make you not a threat. But currently those do not apply here. And currently right now we are all technically at the same range. One, two, three, four, five. He could target any of these four individuals here. Uh, so the way that you end up breaking a tie like that for targeting is the person who is the monster controller. Here we go. Uh, gets to decide which uh, entity the, mar the monster targets when there's a tie like that. And, in fact, if the player targets their own survivor, they gain plus one insanity. So maybe Darian, since she's starting out as the monster controller, if she decides to take this first attack, she'll be able to get one insanity point, which is, uh, as a brief reminder, basically like brain location armor. Um, I think that's not a terrible idea. So I suppose let's go ahead and do that. We'll go ahead and have the monster come to target Darian. So here we go. It's going to move a number of spaces to get up to us. It has a max movement value of six. So that's going to allow it to move one, two, three, four, five. And of course, we are in range there. So let's go ahead. One, two, three, four, five. It will turn to face Darian here. And it will lash out with its ravenous, uh, what's it called? A voracious bite is what it will use. And the attack stats here, it says move and attack target, as we know. Two speed, uh, hits on a three plus, and would deal one damage per hit. Uh, now, if we had the Shattered Mandible permanent uh, injury in play, then it would resolve this instead. But, of course, we have not had a chance to hit the monster yet. So, let us go ahead and roll two D10 dice for this monster. We have a one and a three. Okay, this is a good starting roll. Because the one, of course, does not meet the accuracy three plus value here. So the three, however, would, but uh, at least one of those hits we know is just a straight up miss. So uh, very cool. So let's roll one die for the one damage here. Looks like there's one damage going to our waste location. Thankfully, we actually all start with a cloth armor, which gives one armor point to our waste location from the start. So she is already primed and prepped to let that armor soak the damage from this attack. Wow. Okay, actually, this is a really good start. <laughs> I've seen uh, much worse starts uh, to these battles for before, certainly. So, all in all, can't complain with that. Very good. He targeted the waste, and uh, now Darian does not have any waste armor points, so any further damage that she would incur at the waste, or any other locations for that matter, uh, will inflict injuries. We'll cover those as we get there. Righto. Now that the monster has concluded its AI draw, we now get to go and take our turns. The survivors get to go in any order of their choosing, and I think we're actually going to get Darian, we're going to let Darian go first, and the reason why I don't like being in front of the monster, sometimes these monsters, when their hit location cards are drawn, will attempt to, you know, shoot out in front of them, or maybe they'll run away or something like that, and if a survivor is in the way while it runs away, guess what? That survivor is going to be uh, taking some fallout from that, so... Let's go ahead and move uh, Darian one, two, three, four spaces. Uh, we do have a full movement value of five, but I think four spaces will do just fine for us. And I suppose, since there's not much else to do, uh, Darian will resolve an attack. 
Now, Darian has a driftwood stake, which was referenced in the story. We all grabbed onto that log, tore ourselves off a giant splinter, and here we are, fighting with it. Its attack stats, as you can see, are two dice for the speed. It hits on a 7 plus and has one strength. And uh, it also has a secondary effect. When you wound, you may end your attack and archive this gear to shatter it inside the monster's body. Until the end of the monster turn, if it would move, it does not pretty cool so we can sort of pin it in place as though we are uh stopping it somehow i don't know pinning it to pinning it to something anyway <laughs> all right well two dice here we are looking for values of seven plus on these dice in order to get successful hits uh those are two ones yes those are those are two ones so it begins so those are both going to miss uh pretty sadly so all right, Darian uh, has concluded her turn. Let us go to... Let's go here to Ashley. And she is actually in the blind spot for the monster. And as a brief reminder, people attacking from the blind spot or inhabiting the blind spot, one, are not considered threats, and two, uh, get an attack bonus uh, to their accuracy. I guess because the monster is not actively keeping an eye on you, you're able to target just a little bit better. But first, I think... Actually, no, I won't have her move just yet. Let's go ahead and have her attack. So, uh, she also has a Driftwood Stake, so that's going to be two dice, looking for values of 7+. plus. That is 6 and 6. Normally, that would be a miss, because it's under the value of 7. But just as I said, we are in the blind spot, meaning we get plus 1 to our accuracy, bringing that 6 and 6 to a 7 and a 7, which means that is two hits. So, given that we have two hits here... We get to draw the top two hit location cards, flip them over, reveal them, and we get to decide which one we want to attack first. Alrighty, so we have the Ravenous Jaw here, which has a failure response. Let's read it real quick. The jaw snaps back. Suffer one brain damage. If attacker is adjacent to the monster, it turns to face them and attacks. And this, uh, as you can see, is like a little attack. Speed one, accuracy of three, and that star icon actually deals damage equal to the current level of the monster. We are currently fighting the Prologue monster, which is sort of a slightly easier version of the level 1, but the rulebook did say that this counts as a level 1 monster when it comes to monster damage. So we have a potential of getting uh, one brain damage and one body damage here if we fail to hit, uh, or fail to wound, I suppose. And let's see what this does. This is a reflex. And the Alacritus Operculum, I think is how that's pronounced, I'm not exactly sure, has a reflex response. Reflexes, as a brief reminder, are things that happen in response to whether you wound or fail to wound the monster. So it'll happen no matter what. This one here says, full move the monster away from all survivors, canceling all hits now out of range. So if we resolve this first, and uh, whether we hit or, wo or wounded or not, this monster is just going to go boom, and go right over here and just get out of our way. And because of the fact it says cancel all hits now out of range, if we did this one first, we wouldn't even get a chance to try and wound this uh, hit location right here because he would be way out of the range at that point. So if we want a chance to potentially wound both, we would have to start with the Ravenous Jaw. However, I know it's going to be kind of tough to actually wound this thing. Uh, currently, it has a toughness value of uh, 6. We have 1 strength on our Driftwood Stakes. We need to roll a 5+. plus meaning we roll uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So that's 60% chance to wound. I guess that's not so bad. Maybe we'll start with the Ravenous Jaw, and we'll see what happens here. And then uh, we'll go for this one, and if he runs away, so be it, right? So, uh, and being in the blind spot, I should mention, uh, as a brief reminder, though it gave us a benefit to accuracy, it does not actually help us hit any harder with our wound result. So, uh, no benefits as far as that's concerned. So let's go ahead and roll a d10, and we are looking for a value of 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10. <gasps> a 10? Wow. Well, hey, that's perfect. Okay. So, yes, it doesn't say 10. It actually has this lovely lantern symbol here. But uh, instead of resolving the failure response for dealing a wound, first off, yes, we do successfully deal a wound. So we will take the topmost AI card, put it in the wound stack, and we will not be seeing that AI card come to bother us. All right, and instead of dealing this uh, failure response, we wouldn't resolve it anyway because of the fact that we actually wounded the monster, but we get to resolve this critical wound effect instead. Persistent injury, shattered mandible, affects some AI cards. Yes, it does. In fact, 
we already know which AI card it affects, the Voracious Bite. Now, whenever this card comes back out of the deck, when this reshuffles and cards are revealed again, guess what? It's not going to do all this stuff up here. It's actually going to do this instead. Woohoo! Okay. Okay, very good. Now we have the Alacritus Operculum, and we have to roll for a reflex in 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Let's see another 10. That would be great. Okay, it's a 6, which uh, is between 5 to 10, meaning we deal yet another wound. So, bam, there you go. And the reflex, he is going to swim away from us. Yes, he is. So here we go. He gets to move six spaces. One, two, three, four, five, six. There he is, the coward. He is slithered away. But I mean, I honestly, I wasn't even expecting to crit like that already. So I can't imagine he was expecting that either. So lovely. All right. So our dear friend Ashley did great. Uh, much better than Darian's uh, fortune, but that's okay. All right, moving along, we have our two remaining male survivors here. I suppose, let's let Jacob go first. Jacob is the green, and he gets to move five spaces. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. I am adjacent to the Shrieking Eel, so I can attack. And again, that is two dice, looking for values of seven plus. Ah, uh, that's a 10 and uh, a 2, apparently. So we have 10 and 2. Now, when you roll the uh, 10 on the hit roll, not the wound roll, it's considered a perfect hit. Instead of doing a critical wound, it's called a perfect hit. And other gear interacts with perfect hits in different ways, but we don't currently have any gear that gives you any benefit for the perfect hits yet. Too bad. But it's okay. Let's go ahead and reveal one hit location card, because we did have one successful hit. Sax Terminal, first strike. Okay, so that's a special keyword on hit locations, which means if I, let's say I hit it, and I hit it three times with my attack, or two times, uh, this card would have to be resolved first. Um, it's just one of the rules of the game, and sometimes the monster can trip you up with these first strike cards. It has a reflex response. Uh, and let's go ahead and actually resolve that after we roll, and we'll see what happens. So let's give a quick roll. Look at 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. That's a seven, so that's a wound. Bam, okay. We are three wounds uh, on our way to beating this terrible shrieking eel. And what is the reflex here? Roll 1d10 for each swimming survivor within three spaces of the monster. Well, we already know, according to the shallows, survivors are not swimming. So this reflex isn't going to do anything as far as I know. Let's check. If any of those survivors have metal gear in their gear grid, add plus two to the result. On a roll of 5+, plus, they suffer monster level damage to two random hit locations and are stunned. And you can see the stun uh, text there. Okay. It did not outline what to do if survivors were not swimming. So basically, that's just a reflex that we don't have to worry about. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay. Well, so far, this has been a very productive first turn. I'm uh, incredibly impressed with our survivors here. Now, of course, last but not least, we have Joshua here. Unfortunately, Joshua can't use his five movement to get adjacent to the Shrieking Eel. No, he cannot. Uh, he can move almost there. I say let's put Joshua right here, midway between this group and midway to this other uh, survivor here. Okay, all four of our survivors have taken their actions. Joshua does not have any additional actions. He, I guess he could actually uh, do the Tenseling Bracelet. As you can see, this is that tentacle that has latched onto our arms for our survivors. Apparently we uh, are able to use it as a piece of gear. Uh, in fact, if we spend um, one of our actions, we say it is foul but nutritious. If you can consume, suffer the frenzy brain trauma and fully heal one hit location. Currently he doesn't have any damage, so I really wouldn't want to use that just yet. This gear loses cursed, then archive this card. Cursed is a key word right in the center there uh, that essentially means that I cannot um, unequip it for, like, basically any reason. Okay. Oh, not any reason, but, uh, for most reasons in the game, I can't optionally, uh, unequip it the normal way I would for, let's say, if I was holding the Driftwood Stake, for example. I could let that go at any time. All right. All four survivors have gone, so it is now time for the Shrieking Eel to go. What terrors does it have in store for us? Thrash. The monster lets out a high-pitched keen before coiling on itself. All non-deaf survivors suffer monster-level brain damage. Okay. Oh, but before that, 
Uh, at the start of this monster turn, the monster controller moves from the, whoever had it previously to the person next in uh, clockwise rotation, uh, so to speak. So Joshua is now the monster controller, which means that if that were to have targeted uh, some survivor, you know, random survivor, not random, I guess, uh, it would have allowed him to help control the monster's movement and such, but it doesn't look like the monster's going to be allowing him to do that. All non-deaf survivors suffer monster-level brain damage. We are all not deaf. So Darian should have actually had one insanity, I forgot to add it, for having targeted herself with the monster's first attack. So she is going to soak that one monster-level brain damage right there, bringing her insanity to zero. The rest of us do not have any insanity yet, meaning we are going to get the light brain injury boxes filled for all of our friends. Not sure why. I Maybe I accidentally gave it to that person. Okay. There we go. With those light boxes filled, you'll notice we don't have a heavy box on the brain location like we do for our other spots up here. You can see we have heavy here on the head and all the other body locations, meaning we won't necessarily get knocked down if we take more brain damage, but we will be rolling on the brain severe injury trauma board. Uh, which means that we can potentially develop some disorders and maybe die. I hope not, but you know, it is a possibility. And that's not all it will do. It screamed, it gave us uh, brain damage, and now pick target all survivors in range 3. So range 3 is calculated orthogonally, meaning in spaces north, south, east, and west. North, south, east, and west. What kind of compass are you reading, lad? Uh, east and west, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, from the monster here. So currently we have our friend uh, Jacob, I believe. Yep, Jacob is within range three. He's adjacent to it. But this person, while it looks like he's close, is actually not three orthogonal spaces away, right? We can do one, two, three, or one, two, three. In any case, he is actually at range four from the monster. So he is going to be spared whatever the thrashing effect will be. All right. Attack all targets. This attack gains plus one speed for each plus one movement token the monster has. Currently, the monster does not have any plus one movement tokens, so it's just going to do one speed hitting on a three plus, dealing two damage. And if it does damage, it will use bleed one. Oh boy. All right. Let's uh, hope for a two or a one, huh? That's an eight. That's uh, the opposite end of that spectrum. Okay, so that is going to be one successful hit. And where are we getting hit? Let's find out. In the hands, I see, or the arms, I suppose, technically speaking. So, since I have no armor on the arms, getting two points of damage would fill my light box and my heavy box, which would theoretically knock me over and potentially give me some exhaustion tokens for being knocked over in this water. Hmm, that sounds terrible. I really don't want to do that. And thankfully, we are able to circumvent that. As you can see, we each start by having one survival for having named our survivors. And you can spend the survival on the dodge action, which cancels one hit. So if I spend that survival... Oh, excuse me. I was hit once because this attack was a one-speed attack. So even though it's dealing two damage to the arms, that's two damage in one hit, if that makes sense. So by dodging, I can then decide, you know what? I'm just going to pull my arm back right before the monster thrashes at it and uh, prevent it from getting that two damage, which I think is a pretty good expenditure of that survival. All right. And uh, not getting knocked down, no exhaustion tokens, and ready and primed for an attack. And I think uh, maybe that's what I will do. Right. Yes, indeed. And so, oh, and no bleed token as well, because I didn't get the damage. So that's very good. Um, Let's see. So it's our turns again, and of course, we, with the variable survival turn order, we could go in any order we want. I suppose let's have Joshua go one, two, three, four, right into the blind spot, and he is going to lash out at the uh, Shrieking Eel because he did not get a chance to attack last time, and he's feeling a bit sour about that. Okay, we have eight and six. The six is normally a miss, but with that plus one accuracy in the blind spot, that's going to be a hit. So we have two hits, meaning two cards coming out of here. Bam, bam. What do we got? Oh, got a first strike. So that uh, means that we don't get to pick which one to resolve first. The first strike will resolve itself first. All right. If the Shrieking Eel has more plus one movement tokens than its monster level, it's, it swiftly slips the attack. Cancel this hit and move the monster two spaces forward. Cancel any hits now out of range. <gasps> so if it had, let's say, two plus one movement tokens, it wouldn't even let poor Joshua, who had the hit locations attack. It would go boop, boop, 
and all of a sudden it's now out of range and Joshua couldn't uh, finish his attacks, which is unfortunate. But thankfully, it does not have any plus one movement tokens. And it does have a failure response. We'll resolve that if that uh, ends up being the case. Okay. Rolling one die, looking for a five, six, seven, eight, nine, or ten. <gasps> Another ten! Oh my goodness. Wow, we are critting for days here. Okay, so normally we'd resolve the failure if we failed. Let's go ahead and make sure to deal a wound here. Bloop. There we go. But critical wound. The monster's movement is crippled. It gains a minus one movement token. So even though it's wanting those plus one movement tokens, as you can see here, we gave it a minus one movement. So let's flip that over. Oh, that's accuracy. We don't want that. Let's get a movement token. Flip it over. Plop it right into the board. There we go. And now you can see the board already updated to reduce its movement to five instead of six. What else happens? The attacker may spend five survival to immortalize this movement. Uh, oh, mo I think that's supposed to be moment. I think there's just a typo there. Uh, moment and gain plus one permanent movement once per lifetime. Well, Joshua only has one survival right now, so he will not be able to make uh, any sort of benefit with the plus one permanent movement, but that's okay. That's okay. We'll take the critical wound no matter what. And we get to now resolve the Alacritus Pelvic Fin, which has a failure response. How about another 10? Huh? How about that? That's a two. Okay, so two, even with the plus one strength for our driftwood, driftwood stake, means it's only a three, which falls uh, about halfway to the six toughness we need. So that is a failure. We failed to wound. And we must now perform basic action targeting the attacker. The basic action card, it shows you what the basic action is. Pick target, closest threat in range. You actually already know, normally if it resolves this card, it would pick a target, closest threat in range, no target, blah, blah, blah. But in this case, it says perform basic action, target the attacker. So you already skip the pick target because it already tells you who the target is. Move and attack target. Two speed, three plus uh, accuracy and one damage. So he's really just going to turn right around and stare Joshua in the face with his big bulging eyes. And attack for two speed, hitting on a three plus. Okay. How about a one and a two? How about that? Okay, nine and seven. That's too bad. All right, so that's two hits, one damage apiece. Where's he getting hit? Oh, oh no. The head and the legs. Goodness. Goodness, goodness. So we would deal one damage to the head, which is already a heavy injury, which is going to knock Joshua over, and one damage to the legs here. There we go. Now you might be saying, well, wait, you have a survival point. Why don't you spend the survival point to dodge? Well, unfortunately, in a hit location response like this, you actually don't get to spend survival to dodge because uh, you're sort of committing to the attack. Like you're swinging your weapon and you've uh, extended yourself. You're not able to spend survival to dodge at this point. So unfortunately, poor Joshua is going to be bonked in the head. There we go. That is knocking him over and that's going to net him at the end of the round one exhaustion token. So I'll place that there as a reminder. No, poor Joshua. He's been knocked right into the drink. No good. Okay, too bad. Well, I mean, we've been hitting it pretty well, though. So I, the fact that that's our first miss is actually, like, pretty pretty good. Okay. Moving along, we have our two ladies here. We have Ashley and Darian, uh, neither of which have the movement range to actually make it over to the Shrieking Eel uh, for an attack this turn. But we could get them a little closer. So let's go one, two, three, four, five. And one, two, three, four. Mm, let's put it right there. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, okay. Perfect. So everyone has gone. All around me are familiar faces. Worn out. Which means it is now uh, the monster's turn, which means it's a new round meaning we get our first exhaustion token. Now, of course, it's not really going to do anything too terrible to us until there are five of those, or we're getting near five anyway. Uh, so I'm not too worried about it, but, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. Okay. Tail slap. Pick target, random survivor in blind spot. Ah, see, so that's actually one of those cards I mentioned in my primer video where that could punish you for hanging out in the blind spot too long. Thankfully, there is currently no one there, so we will move on to the second targeting condition. Closest threat in range. Now, a threat is a survivor who is not in the blind spot and is standing up. And it looks like Joshua is currently down in the drinks. The monster has said, okay, he's not a threat to me. He's floundering for his sad little life. So the closest threat in range now defaults instead to 
Jacob. Here we go. So he is going to turn and he is going to attack. This attack gains plus one speed for each plus one movement token the monster has. Well, the monster actually has the opposite of that, a minus one movement token, which is excellent. Too bad it doesn't mean that it reduces the monster's speed, but that's okay. And anyway, it looks like uh, turn the Shrieking Eel to place the target in its blind spot. I see. So it's sort of whipping itself to hit us with its nasty tail. Now, it's too, uh, the, I will mention here as well, with the minus one, uh, it doesn't get minus one speed. And in fact, speed one is the lowest you can ever get anyway. You can't have like zero speed. So in that case, uh, you know, that's how that would resolve. Okay, we have a one speed attack hitting on a three plus, and it will deal one damage. Let's see. Two or one, two or one, two or one. Oh, technically the monster controller is now Jacob, but uh, the monster already told you exactly who it was targeting, so I don't get to uh, break the tie on that, meaning I don't get that insanity. All right, that's an eight. So it's going to hit. It's going to hit one hit location. Where is it going? The hand. I see the hand or the arms. Good thing I spent that survival to dodge because remember, if I had taken that two damage to the arms, this would theoretically be a third damage to the arm location, meaning I would roll on that arm severe injury table and potentially have something terrible happen to my arms. Thankfully, it's just a light injury, which incurs no penalty on its own. Very good. Okay, but it does have an after damage effect. The target gains minus two accuracy until the end of the round. Well, that's no good. Okay, so accuracy, here we go. I'll throw some tokens down there. So normally, I hit on a seven plus here, and I would be hitting on a six plus from the blind spot. But with these minus two accuracy, that means this seven plus becomes a nine plus, and then an eight plus in the blind spot. Meaning it's harder to hit this monster for the duration of this round. Thankfully, it's only a temporary effect though, but um, I mean, I guess I am in the blind spot. So, you know, th for whatever that's worth, there's that that is a thing that exists. Okay, now it's the end of the next monster's turn since Joshua has been knocked over, so he gets to stand back up finally. Very good for him. I think first order of business, I'm going to have Jake, uh, Jacob here try to attack. Two dice. That's a 10, which is going to hit. The 6 will not. But at least we did get one hit on this thing. Okay. And the minus 2 accuracy only affected this roll. So really that 10 is an 8 and that 6 is a 4. But uh, it does not affect the wound roll because that uses the strength stat. All right. We have Alacritus Eyes, which has a wound response. The Shrieking Eel focuses on the attacker. They gain the priority target token. Oh, boy. So the priority target token is this blue thing right here. And what that means is... Instead of picking the, I love this lovely uh, art here shows, instead of picking the target normally displayed on an AI card, it instead will target this person instead. Hmm. Righto. Well, let's go ahead, excuse me, let's go ahead and try our roll for the wounds here, and we need a 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10. Oh, that's a 2, so that's a, a, a miss. Thankfully, though, that was not a, su a successful wound. So this wound response will actually not currently uh, target and bother my friend. Now that my action is spent, I think I'll spend my movement to open up some slots in the blind spot here for our friends to take advantage of instead. So I'm going to go mm, one, two, three, four. I'll go right over here. All right. Joshua is angry. He spent some time. He's dripping wet. And he's mad. He's mad at this uh, shrieking... Eel. So he's going to go ahead and try to strike out at it. That is one, two, three, four, right here into the blind spot. Rolling two dice, hitting on a six plus. Let's see what we can get. A one and a nine. Okay, the one is uh, clearly a miss, but the nine is a hit. Let's see what we hit instead. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. So this is the trap card, and it has the special coloring to kind of indicate that trap. Reshuffle the hit location deck, but after resolving this. All survivors are doomed. Doomed means that we cannot spend survival points to dodge this attack, which sucks. Full move the monster toward the attacker. Remove all plus one movement tokens from the monster and extend the shock zone in the dark blue zone by one ring for each movement token discarded. So the more movement tokens it would have, the further out it would be able to reach. Currently it doesn't have any, so it's just going to use... The light ring around itself, which attacks all adjacent targets. So there he is. He's zapping. And you know, actually, let me make sure he turns to look at him. 
Let's just full move uh, to the monster toward the attacker. So there you go. All right. So he's going to do this without moving. Perform basic action. Oh, right. So you don't uh, do the movement on the basic action right here, which he wouldn't move anyway. Without moving, perform basic action attack against each survivor in the shock zone. Currently, there is only one survivor there, so it's just going to punish poor Joshua. Targets wearing metal suffer an additional monster level damage to each rolled location because, in this case, capacitor discharge is an electric style attack. So, of course, if you're wearing metal, you conduct electricity better, which means you take more damage. So, very cool. All right. And now that this trap is here, we go ahead and put it back, all the cards back into the Shrieking Eel hit location, shuffle it a few times, and we're ready to strike those cards anew. But let's go ahead and resolve the attack. Two speed, three plus. One damage. Twos and ones, please. Twos and ones, please. Oh, there's a two. Look at that. Excellent. We did get one two, which means that the monster did hiss. With, hit, uh, did hiss. The monster did miss with one of their hit attempts. But the ten, of course, naturally is a hit. So let's go ahead and roll where that electricity hit us. In the arms location. Okay. So that's going to deal one damage to the arms there because we're not wearing any metal armaments right now goodness gracious well our first round went so well but currently this is not going as well for us is it all right moving on to our ladies darian is going to move into the blind spot here and try to strike at the shrieking eel so that's two dice hitting on six plus eight and eight that's two hits okay one two. Oh no Okay, these aren't in it. I guess they're not bad by themselves, but look at this. Alacritus Spine, plus two toughness to wound this location. Normally, we have to get a five plus to hit this thing, but with plus, plus two toughness to the wound location, that means it's a seven plus to wound this, and a seven plus as well to wound the Alacritus Viscera. Oh, man. So seven, eight, nine, ten, that's 40% wound potentials on both of these, but we have to do it. Let's see which one we want to do first. We have a failure response. Perform basic action target the attacker. At the end of that attack, full move the monster away from all survivors. Hmm. So if we miss the monster, which is decently likely, we have a 60% chance to uh, fail to wound, it'll not only basic attack me, but then it's going to move away, meaning I won't be able to resolve this. So let's look at this one. Wound response. The blow disrupts the monster's vital sensory organs. It gains minus one accuracy token until the end of the monster turn. Okay. Okay, now that is uh, actually a good wound response. And if we fail, then it doesn't actually do anything bad to us. So this one is clearly the one we want to try to attack first. All right, we're rolling a die. We're hoping for a 7+. plus. Come on. That's a 2. That is not going to do it. So it is a failure, but no failure responses here, so that's okay. All right, Alacritus Spine. Here we go, 7+. plus. Another one. That's another 2. Goodness. Oh, we had such a strong opening round. What happened? <laughs> Perform basic action. Target the attacker. At the end of the attack, full move the monster away from all survivors. Okay. There we go. So he is turning to face Darian, and he is going to use his two speed, three plus one damage. Here we go. Let's get some ones and twos. We were happy to give me twos earlier. Of course, threes. Just what the monster needed. Ah. It's too bad we didn't get that one that reduced its accuracy. If it did, then those threes would have been misses, and that would have been perfect. All right, we have a body location die, and we or we have a body uh, torso die here. We have an arm here, so that's going to be two damage, one to arm and one to body. Body here, arm here, and again, we cannot spend our survival to dodge those because that's a hit location response action. All right, at the end of the attack, full move the monster away from all survivors. Okay, so currently there's sort of a split here uh, between how to get away from all survivors if we go left, right. Certainly doesn't make sense to go down, so I guess we're going to go up, which means that this monster is going to go through our dear friend right here. And in, in colliding with a target like that, uh, let's see, let me make sure I counted that right. One, two, three, four, five spaces because uh, the minus one movement. When colliding with a target like that, uh, it will knock that person over which is unfortunate because, uh, as we recall, that's going to potentially give that person, oh, that's Darian, one of those exhaustion tokens, leading them 
one fifth of the way toward a drowning status and just knocking them over, which is terrible. Okay. Now, Ashley is here, and she's quite a ways away from being able to attack this thing. So I suppose Ashley's just going to get a little closer here, like that. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Alrighty, everyone has gone. It is now time for the monster to go. Uh, she will get her exhaustion token, and now that the round has ended, my minus two accuracy penalty is gone as well. Monster controller is now Ashley. What is the monster going to do? intimidating display pick target closest survivor in range now notice it didn't say closest threat so the closest survivor in range currently is in fact our friend darian there we go let's see what he's going to do to that survivor intimidate target the shrieking eel thrashes around in the water making it foam and churn disturbingly roll 1d10 on a result of 4 plus the target suffers monster level brain damage and is knocked down Okay, so actually it doesn't turn to face her necessarily. It just sort of slishes and sloshes around making some sea foam here and knocked down Darian, I guess maybe is uh, disturbed by that given that she is in um, a vulnerable state. Okay, so she has to roll a d10 on a four plus. She gets a brain damage and is knocked down. She's already knocked down, so she can't be knocked down again, but let's see if she gets some brain damage. <laughs> of course she does. Good thing we ended up giving her that plus one insanity for the fact that she was the monster controller and targeted herself. So that's only going to result in a light brain injury. Okay. And that is all the monster is going to do on this one. And since it is the end of the next monster turn, in fact, Darian is going to be able to stand up. Okay. All right. Moving along. Let's see. Um, oh, who to have attack? Darian. Darian's going to go two spaces forward and attack from the eel's blind spot. We are rolling two dice, hitting on a six plus. Come on, please. Five and seven. Okay, so the seven just barely squeaks by. Ravenous inner jaw. Reflex. The ravenous jaw snaps back. Suffer one brain damage. If the attacker is adjacent to the monster, it turns to face them and does this attack. Oh, that's a reflex. Oh, it's going to happen no matter what. All right, at least give us a wound here. Eight. Yes, eight is going to wound. So now that uh, all the cards here are in the AI discard pile, whether the monster would draw a new AI card or whether you would wound, you take all these cards here, flip them over, shuffle them, and then if we were revealing an AI card, you flip it over. We're dealing wounds. So we're going to put that wound card right over there. Ah, unfortunately, though, reflex. It's going to happen. So I'm going to get one brain damage. Uh-oh. Now we know with Darian... She already has her brain injury box filled. So that means that poor Miss Darian is going to be rolling on the severe brain injury chart. It's a mental breakdown. <sighs> Here we go. Okay, yikes, yikes, yikes. And you see we have some pretty haunting art over here. Uh, indeed. And let us roll a d10 here. There's what? Here it is. I was trying to remember where it was. Okay, so we roll a d10. We see what we get. That is an 8. What is that? Lunacy. Gain a random disorder and 1 d5 insanity. Now, d5 is just the roll result of a d10, and you divide by 2 rounding up. So let's take a look and see what we get for insanity. That's a 10. She's going to get five freaking insanity on there. The best real results as a uh, D5 can give you. Wow. Okay. So her brain's going to be protected for a while. Maybe whatever disorder she gets uh, has just driven her insane. All right. So we'll shuffle this disorders deck. We'll draw one. Uh, what do we got? Weak spot. Okay. Let's drag that over to her play area. Okay. You have an imaginary infirmity. When you, gain this dis <clears throat> when you gain this disorder, roll a random hit location and record it. You cannot depart unless you have armor at this hit location. Okay, so she has decided that she has some, uh, some injury, maybe uh, an old sports injury at the torso body location here. Uh, and she will refuse to go out on a hunt or a showdown without having some armor covering her chest. So, wow. All right, let's go ahead and record that. I'll just put it right here in the impairments spot. Go, let's say weak spot chest. 
There we go. All right, so she thinks she's got a weak spot now. Maybe the, the ravenous jaw there, when it snapped back, it, uh, it attacked her. And it should have turned around to do that. So let me go ahead and uh, orient it that way. Right, so she is done. And by that, of course, I mean we are going to finish resolving the monster's reflex here. Of course, <laughs> nearly forgot there. Let's go ahead and give this a roll. That is a 9, so that is going to hit. Let's go ahead and roll a body die as well to see where it's going to hit. That is the waist. The waist. Okay, so we're going to get a light injury at the waist now. Yes, indeed. Very good. So next, let's have Ashley go. Ashley looks like she can sneak right up beside this creature, and she can attack. That is two dice, and she's not in the blind spot, so it's just going to be the two dice hitting on a 7+. plus. There we go. Five and five. Okay, that's not going to do it. Nope. No, it won't. Okay. And our friends over here are just a little too far away, so we'll have them move just a bit closer. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. And you know what? Since he doesn't have an action to do this turn, how about we allow him to rest, which allows him to remove two exhaustion tokens. He only has, or up to two. He only has one, so that's just going to get rid of that and get him unexhausted. I figure that's probably not a bad idea. If we're lucky, now that it's the monster's turn, it's going to reveal that card that will interact with the uh, the injury we gave it, the Shattered Mandible, but we'll see what happens. Nope, we have an Intimidating Display, closest survivor in range, and the monster controller is Darien once more. So we have two survivors that are currently tied for that right now. So Darien gets to potentially pick who it is, and you know... Given that this is going to deal brain damage, Darian is actually the person who is best equipped to deal with it anyway, because of the fact that, as you remember, Darian got five freaking insanity from having uh, taken that uh, brain trauma. So you know what? Yeah, let's go ahead and have Darian take it. She's the monster controller, so she gets plus one insanity for targeting herself, which means potentially she'll just go back to five anyway. All right, result of four plus. Here we go. So let's do one, two, or three. One, two, or three. That's a three. Perfect. So in this case, uh, she is not going to resolve the intimidate action here. She is unintimidated by the Shrieking Eel. Okay, lovely. The Shrieking Eel's turn is over with. And now it's our turns. I think first order of business, we need to get Darian out of this guy's line train here. So I suppose we'll go one, two, three, four, five. Right into the blunt. Oops. Meant to rotate her. Right into the blind spot for this creature. Let's see if we can intimidate it instead. Two dice hitting on a six plus from the blind spot. We have six and seven. That's two hits. Well, well, well. How the turntables. Okay, what do we got? Okay, we have a wound response. The monster lets out a piercing shriek. All non-deaf survivors suffer monster level plus one brain damage. Oh, no. Okay, wow. So in this case, that would be two brain damage to everyone, which is going to give some injuries to our friends here. Ugh. <sighs> you know what? Even though I don't want to miss out on the chance to wound, I notice this reflex. The monster spins and coils over itself. Rotate the monster to face directly away from the attacker and move two spaces forward. So it would move two spaces away, canceling all hits now out of range, which means we wouldn't have to risk getting this to happen. And I think that's better than having three severe brain traumas. So let's go ahead and do the Alacritus Swim Bladder instead uh, as the first one. So here we go. Five plus. That's a five. So that is going to result in a wound. So at least it wasn't a complete waste. All right. We wounded, which will trigger the reflex here. It spins the coils away. Move two spaces directly forward. Cancel all hits now out of range. Loop, loop. There we go. There we go. Bingo. Okay. And we prevented ourselves from having this shriek. Because if we did that first, that thing would have been shrieking. Severe in or severe brain trauma, brain trauma, and brain trauma. Which is terrible. Alright. I guess the other bit of good news is now that it's moved forward, it's opened up a new blind spot for us. So we now have uh, more slots back here we could put people to attack. So like, let's say Ashley wants to go here. Move over one, and she's going to attack from the blind spot. Two dice, hitting on six plus. Okay, the six is a hit. Okay, perfect. It wouldn't have been if we weren't in the blind spot, but that's uh, how this worked out. 
Alacritus Caudal Fin. First strike. If the Shrieking Eel has more plus one movement tokens than its monster level, it swiftly avoids the attack. Cancel the hit. Move the monster two spaces forward. Well, it actually has a minus one movement token, so we're good on that. Uh, response failure. Okay. If it fails, then uh, something will happen. Don't fail us, Ashley. We need a five plus. That's a nine. Perfect. That is going to do it. Right, so we'll deal one wound. As you can see, we're coming up near the end of our AI deck, so we are near the end of this battle. Right, we do not resolve the failure response because we did not fail to wound. Righto, who to go next? We have Joshua and we have Jacob. I think we'll let Joshua go. So he's going to move four spaces right here into the blind spot, and he is going to roll two dice right here. Okay, the perfect hit, of course, uh, doesn't do anything for us yet, except give us a hit. So we have one hit here. All right, Alac Alacritus Electro Nodes has a wound response. Okay, here we go, five plus. That's a seven, which is a five plus. Okay, so we do successfully wound the monster. Oh, that's the wound stack. So here we go. There's only one card here, so that's going to go right into the trash. The AI deck is empty, but we actually have to deal one more wound for this basic action. So, unfortunately, we're going to resolve this wound response. The monster gains minus one accuracy until the end of its turn. The attacker gains the priority target token. Okay. Okay, well, minus one accuracy. Here we go. And to explain what that means in terms of the monster, that means that, let's say, well, actually, we know it's going to do its basic action, potentially. Uh, that is two speed. Instead of a three plus, it needs to get, it actually needs to get a four plus. Uh, which is uh, a little bit hard. It gives us uh, a 1 to 3 R misses uh, at that point. And, of course, it does get the priority target token. So this monster is going to attack Joshua for having attacked its Alacritus Electro Nodes, uh, which is uh, going to happen quite shortly. But we do have our green player, Jacob, who now can come right over to the side and might, in fact, finish the monster off before it gets a chance to attack his friend Joshua. Okay. <laughs> you have no power here. Here we go. All right, we need seven plus here because we are not in the blind spot. That is a nine and a nine according to uh, our list here. So those are two hits. Oh dear. We have 13 cards left. The trap is coming up. I know it. Where is it? Lacritus Pelvic Fin. Not the trap. Okay, okay, gotcha. So we have the Alacritus Pelvic Fin with a failure response. Perform basic ac action targeting the attacker. And we have the Alacritus Flank, which is a wound response, moving it forward, canceling hits out of range. So let's do that second. Let's do this one first. Okay. Five plus, five plus, five plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ending on a critical hit, my friends. Look at that Lantern 10. Oh, glorious. You sever the fin entirely. The monster gains minus one speed token and discards plus one movement token. Doesn't have any of those to discard. You may spend three survival to cut deep, cut deep gashes into your arms and implant the fin. What? Gain two bleeding tokens and the following ability. Arm fins. Plus one movement while swimming. You cannot wear armor at the arms location. When you depart, add plus two armor to the arms location archive this card wow whoa that is super cool i mean it's the end of the battle and i don't have that survival to spend to do that but that's the first time i've seen uh uh hitting a, a hit location that actually gives you an ability like that wow that's super neat it's too bad i don't get to have some arm well actually they're, they're they sound a little creepy anyway but in any case we did the critical wounds and that is going to finish the battle by putting the basic action into the wound stack. And the monster is dead. Bing, bang, boom. That's the way it's done, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So we have won our first battle against the Shrieking Eel. And we get some post-battle rewards according to the rulebook. I already know what they are. You get four Shrieking Eel resources, which for some reason says White Lion on here still. And we have uh, basic resources here. So I'll give these decks a shuffle. Get one. Monster Bone, a Broken Lantern, a Broken Lantern, and a Monster Organ. And from the monster itself, we get a Sax Organ, which says, This metal and organ holds quite a charge. When gained, nominate a survivor to suffer electroshock. 
They gain plus two insanity and lose one survival. Well, um, okay. Currently, Jacob doesn't have any survival anyway, so you know what? Let's just let him take it because he doesn't have survival. He won't lose anything. All right, so I just got shocked by the organ. What else we have? Flexible ribbing. The thin bone can bend with incre uh, incredible elasticity. Okay, there's a bit of a typo there. That's okay. Hardened scale. Little typo there as well. The deep grooves in the oblong scale oddly resemble those of your fingernails. Hmm. Okay. And the eel's eye organ. A multi-pupiled orb. Okay. And one thing I'm going to do real quick, because I know that these don't clone themselves the way that uh, the other cards. So you can see when I pulled these cards, four copies of them went up here into the clone pile. These ones, for whatever reason, don't seem to do that. So I'm going to make sure that we get those back in there. There we go. So we have eight lovely resources to bring back to the settlement. Excellent. Now we are ready to move on to the first settlement phase. Now the first settlement phase in this lantern year is um, a bit involved, or at least a bit more involved than others, because there are some preparatory events that happen that set up your starting population and various other things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a highlights reel of that, of just showing where each of the things go through, because I'll be honest, sometimes... When I'm deciding what gear to build and I'm deciding what to do with my resources, I can sometimes take a little while. And that very boring. It can be a pretty boring to watch. So I will go ahead and compose a montage here that sets up the next settle or sets up our settlement phase and sets up what our survivors are going to have and what happened and give you sort of a narrative overview of that with uh, some visuals here. And then we'll come back when it's time to do the hunt and the showdown again. So. Uh, cut time right now. After Darian, Ashley, Joshua, and Jacob gathered the soaked remnants of their quarry and caught their collective breaths, they found their way to a place of refuge around the driftwood effigy. Eight other survivors made their way to shore there and congregated with the four, leading to the settlement's official name, the Coastal Congregation. Darian had proven her mental mettle in the fight against the Shrieking Eel, and as such she pioneered the path for the congregants and taught them a shared language, unifying them and allowing them to collaborate. With the weight of leadership settling on her shoulders, Darian opted to spend some time on the shoreline reflecting on their path forward. Though she and the other three coiled congregants gained valuable battle experience in the first eel encounter, Darian's task precluded her from participating in the next monster excursion. It definitely had nothing to do with her fear that none of the monster remnants could be used to fashion armor for her weak spot yet, of course. Staring out at the endless plateau of hypnotically rhythmic waves, Darian was able to attune her focus to discern their shifting structure on a deeper level, prompting a prescience of its combat application. She would be ready for the next monster encounter, assuming she could cover her chest, that is. The other survivors got to work straight away, constructing the starting settlement crafting locations, the bonesmith, the skinnery, and the organ grinder. After that, they reviewed what resources they had to work with, and weighed the options of how best to use them should they need to face another beast from below. The common consensus was that the makeshift driftwood stakes were functional, but would soon prove unreliable for damaging tougher prey. The monster failed to yield any hide with which to fashion defensive tools, so the idea shifted toward having a strong offense as an offset. As such, Ashley and Joshua were the first wielders of the coastal congregation's first two bone weapons, and both immediately volunteered to take them for a spin with Jacob and Sophia. Prior to their departure though, Robert increased his understanding by tinkering with a broken lantern. Unfortunately, his tinkering ended up destroying the broken lantern. Darian will not be pleased to hear of his wastefulness. With axes in hand, the hunting crew departed from the settlement in search of another eel. That's where we'll pick it up next time, at the start of the hunt phase. But until then, thanks so much for watching, and I'll hope to be back real soon. Take care.